friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to our online service of worship for Riverside United Church in London, Ontario. Uh, for this Sunday, Sunday, June 7th, Trinity Sunday, my name is Dave Exley. I'm the lead minister for Riverside. Now, this is Pride Month, and as a, an affirming community of faith, we want to share that we are a community that attempts to celebrate what it means to be an affirming church that celebrates diversity, to be a church that celebrates the diversity of sexuality, gender, race, age, differing abilities, and so much more. At Riverside, we declare ourselves a church that has not merely arrived at a place where we may say who we are today, uh, but a church that, that makes our declaration, uh, that attempts to live into the calling of what it means to celebrate diversity. And so happy Pride Month. I hope you all feel a sense of God's spirit uh, with you today as we worship in our separate spaces. Now, typically on Sundays that are the first Sunday in the month, we celebrate birthdays for that particular month with Timbits uh, before and after services. Uh, so if this is your birthday month, happy birthday to you. You can celebrate with a Timbit or better yet, a boxcar donut if you've not already discovered that, uh, that treat here in London, Ontario. And as we continue with this time of quarantine away from our building, uh, we continue to ask for your monetary support for our ministry operation. I know that fatigue has set in for many of us. We gave with great enthusiasm at the beginning of this time of pandemic. And I suppose it's natural for that enthusiasm to fade away as the weeks move on. But, but please, uh, do us a favor. Help us out today by going online and making a donation to the life-saving ministry of Riverside United Church. It only takes a minute or so to, to make a difference for our community of faith and the wider community here in London. And so, friends, as we worship together, let us celebrate the God who is three in one as we open our service in song. Let us worship together.
Our scripture reading for this morning will be a familiar one for many of us. Uh, Thanks to Mark Smith, our 1030 Music Director, for reading this passage from Genesis 1 for us this morning. A reading from Genesis 1. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, Let there be light and so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning the first day. God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate the waters from each other. God made the dome and separated the waters under the dome from the waters above the dome. And it happened in that way. God named the dome sky. There was evening and there was morning the second day. God said, let the waters under the sky come together in one place so that the dry land can appear. And that's what happened. God named the dry land earth and God named the gathered waters seas. God saw how good it was. God said, Let the earth grow plant life, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees bearing fruits with seeds inside it, each according to its kind throughout the earth. And that's what happened. The earth produced plant life, plants yielding seeds, each according to its kind, and trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. 
There was evening and there was morning the third day. God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will mark events, sacred seasons, days and years. They will be lights in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth. And that's what happened. God made the stars and two great lights, the larger light to rule over the day and the smaller light to rule over the night. God put them in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw how good it was. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. God said, let the waters swarm with living things and let birds fly above the earth up in the dome of the sky. God created the great sea animals and all the tiny living things that swarm in the waters, each according to its kind, and all the winged birds, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. Then God blessed them. Be fertile and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. God said, let the earth produce every kind of living thing, livestock, crawling things, and wildlife. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, and every kind of creature that crawls on the ground. God saw how good it was. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. Then God said, I now give to you all the plants on the earth that yield seeds, and all the trees whose fruit produces its seeds within it. These will be your food to all wildlife, to all the birds in the sky, and to everything crawling on the ground, to everything that breathes, I give all the green grasses for food. And that's what happened. God saw everything God had made. It was supremely good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The heavens and the earth and all who live in them were completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work that God had done. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that God had done. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Normally when I begin my sermons, I pray a very specific prayer. But today I want to offer up a different prayer that's rooted in our tradition. Uh, the prayer that comes from Psalm 19 is one that should be familiar to some of you. It's one that is shared by so many clergy of many different colors, many different backgrounds. And so may I pray this prayer as we enter into this time together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to God, to the one who is love. Amen. One of the first things you do in seminary when you study the Hebrew Bible, what many refer to in our tradition as the Old Testament, is you look at how the Judeo-Christian creation narratives compare to other creation accounts from the ancient Near East. We do this for a number of different reasons. We do this because if we're going to understand our own creation narratives, we must understand what other traditions had to say about the cosmos and how that informed the one that has evolved or the few that have evolved into our own tradition. These ancient Near Eastern creation narratives were, in many ways, unapologetically polytheistic. There were many gods. In the creation story, we see all of these gods, and some of them are very powerful, 
and others are not very powerful. There's a hierarchy in most of these other narratives. In some of these stories, these gods are aloof and disconnected from the earth, disinterested in humanity. But in others, the gods are actively engaged into the lives of the world and in humanity. In one narrative, a Babylonian myth known as the Enuma Elish, the gods created humans and then later regretted the decision and schemed to destroy the human race because they were too noisy. Interesting story. These deities would battle, kill, enslave, and retaliate against each other and humans. Humans were often caught in the midst of these disputes between the gods. The Israelite tradition is one of the first to portray God and creation in a very different way. Yes, there are still remnants of a pre-monotheistic tradition. Uh, just look at verse 26 in the opening chapter of Genesis where we read, Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image to resemble us. But this is really the, the first narrative, more importantly, to approach the relationship between God and creation, God and humanity, from a very different perspective, to relay it as one of deep connection, deep love, and deep blessing. Genesis 1 is, is very much a, a love song or a poem that reflects a God who creates with great, great intention, a God who looks upon creation, upon humanity with great love. One need not worry about the order of what happens on each day of creation in the narrative. This isn't a scientific or historic text. It's a spiritual one. All we need to do is, is focus on those repetitive phrases of God said, and then God saw how good it was. And while the concept of Trinity is only vaguely present in the text, uh, the only thing we do see, or the one thing we do see, is this relationship that God is interested between humanity and God. And with that said, on this Trinity Sunday, I want to focus on two <laughs> images that may guide our understanding of what the power of uh, the Trinity means for us and what it means to be a people who celebrate a triune God, a God who is father and mother, a God who is Jesus, the incarnate or human one, and a God who is spirit, or put differently, a God who is creator, redeemer, and sustainer. The first image I want to share is one that you may have heard me talk about before. It's a famous image. It's a 15th century Russian icon called Trinity, created by Andrei Rublev. Richard Rohr calls it, for him, the most perfect piece of religious art there is is. It's a powerful statement. The painting is also known by another name, the, the Hospitality of Abraham, as it depicts the story of the three angels visiting Abraham and Sarah and the oaks at the Oaks of Mamre, found in Genesis 18. I love the idea of Rublev weaving together this, this image of the Trinity with this story from Genesis 18. It gives us something to consider as we ponder our relationship with God and the vision that God has for the world. I love the, the feminine images present in this as well, reminding us that using feminine imagery and pronouns for God is not a recent development. We shouldn't shy away from it. In this icon, this image, I believe we see the same vision that the writer of Genesis 1 sees, a God who sees goodness in the world and a God who is rooted in relationship. Experts, as some of you know, who have studied this icon have suggested that, that it may have originally been uh, an icon that was attached with a mirror on the bottom of it, suggesting that the artist's intention was to invite us into the image, into the icon. We can see the opening at the, the feet of the angels or the figures in the image. In fact, there's a triangle at the bottom, a, a Trinitarian image that is incomplete that invites us to come in. In this, we imagine that God is not complete without us, and we are not complete without God. The table always calls out for one more, and one more, and one more to join. Using this image, Richard Rohr states, 
This table is not reserved exclusively for three, nor is the divine circle dance a closed circle. We're all invited in. All creation is invited in, and this is the liberation God intended from the very beginning. This icon is about freedom. It's about openness and liberation, which is why I love the reinterpretation of this Trinity icon that the artist Meg Rowe created a few years ago. The piece was no doubt inspired by Rublev, but also inspired by an observation that Elizabeth Henry, uh, who was and is the National Advisor for the Committee for Minority Ethnic Anglican Concerns in the Church of England, who said that when people uh, from black or mi minority ethnic communities enter church buildings, they often won't see themselves represented in the iconography or visual art. She adds this note, art should be better than this. Certainly religious art should be better than this. Through this work of art, we, we see an image of our God who has created and is creating, one who continues to speak words of creation like in the ones that we find in Genesis 1. After the creation, God steps back and we hear those words, God saw how good it was. When we see how supremely good our own image is coupled with the relational image of our creator, we begin to see as God sees. The second image that I want to share with you comes from a prominent First Nations tribe here in North America. Now, if you participate in our six-week Zoom study series, The Four Gospel Journey, uh, that starts this Wednesday evening, look for more information on that. You'll hear the host, Alec Alexander Shia, talk about this practice that he learned during the time that he spent uh, with a Lakota tribe in the United States. You see, in the Lakota tradition, they have a particular individual that they call a Heoka. The Heoka is someone who receives a, a vision in their adolescent vision quest, that they're being called to this specific role, to be the Heoka. It is a role that is not an easy one. In fact, far from it. Shia suggests that, that this role is the most honored and most arduous role of the entire people because the Heoka is called to enflesh every way, in every way, but, and not play acting, but to enflesh in every way being the other. The Heoka at a wedding is going to wail as if at a funeral, and at a funeral they're going to be humorous and joyful, perhaps as at a wedding. You'll often see the Heoka walking backward, perhaps riding backwards, as we see in this image. You'll see the Heoka uh, learning to be ambidextrous as well. They simply take on the, the, the physical and emotional characteristics that are the opposite of most of us. And the most honored role of the Heoka is what they do when they are at council when the tribe is discerning a particular question or, or a need within the community, a decision that needs to be made. When the tree or elder has called the people together to be in discernment about that same question, at this moment, like any tribe or, or group of people, the voices around the circle may, in fact, begin to move in one direction. The, ho the heoka, from a place of inner truth and integrity, must speak the opposite. They are not to be adversarial in this place, but for the indigenous people, the Americans, they know that unless every voice is heard and respected, we cannot make a good discerning decision. So the Heoka is speaking what we are often uncomfortable with. I can't help but be moved by this image from the Lakota people. I long to learn more about it. For in some ways, I see the story of creation of Genesis 1 as a Heoka-like story. While all the voices of the ancient Near East spoke of gods that were adversarial, perhaps completely disconnected from humankind, or, or gods who were angry at humanity, the writer of Genesis 1 takes the opposite view and explores what it might be like to look upon God with different eyes 
to look upon one another with the eyes of love rather than the eyes of judgment. Likewise, I believe that the Trinitarian God we worship, or at the very least, the one who is the one that we attempt to understand, is a God who welcomes the voice of the other. God's very nature is one that longs not for conformity, but for plurality. The image of the Trinity is one that celebrates difference. To be complete as a people, to be made in the image of God, to, to welcome God is to welcome the Heoka. And not just the, the other that exists on the, the outside, but we need to welcome the Heoka, that inner Heoka, that voice that comes from within as well. Not the hurtful voice, but the one that can elevate who we are. Okay, I lied. There is a, a third image, but it's an image that, that fits well with the Hayoka image and the Trinity icon. Well, this past week during a protest in nearby Buffalo, New York, many of us watched in horror as an old man walked toward a police group, a group in riot gear, and was knocked to the ground violently, suffering some serious injuries. Fortunately, not life-threatening. He's in stable condition in hospital, last I heard. This image for me represents a modern day example of what it means to reject the Hayoka, or put in our faith context, to, to reject the Trinitarian God of love, the one who longs for relationship, the one who always welcomes the other to the table. For to be a person of faith in the Christian tradition is to do the opposite of what we saw in that scene from Buffalo. It's to do the opposite of what we also saw in Washington, D.C., just outside the White House a few days ago. For if we're going to faithfully hold up the Bible and proclaim our allegiance to the God of love, the God who is three in one, we must embrace the other. We must embrace the one, most especially when they disagree with us. We need one another to be whole. For the God who spoke into the darkness before the universe was formed saw all history, all of humanity, in all shapes and forms. The God who saw not only me and people who look like me, but it's a God who saw all. A God who, God who saw my neighbor. A God who saw those who came before me and those who will come after me. A God who sees you, those who look like you and those who look very different from you, and declares the goodness in all creation. Not just the parts of creation that certain people declare to be good. All of it. And so, there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The heavens and the earth and all who lived in it were completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work that God had done. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that God had done. And so may we, the ones who live in the light and darkness of that eighth day, learn what it means to honor our relational God. May we welcome the stranger and continue to dream of wholeness along with God and with all creation. Amen. As we move into this time of prayer, let us... Hear those words again from Genesis 1, proclaiming the goodness of all creation. Let us enter the dance with our God. Let us walk up to the table with God, joining God. May we summon that inner hyoka that calls us to hear the voices of difference within this world. And so listen to these words as God makes that holy declaration on us and on others. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, 
Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, God called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky, to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth and there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created the human, humanity, Adam in God's image. In the image of God, God created him, it, male and female, God created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth and everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. 
God saw everything that God had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that God had done, and God rested on the seventh day from all the work that God had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. We pile up like dry bones, like orphans gathering in burden. We're broken, our defenses fracturing. So new again 
Friends, our God, who created you in the divine image, blesses you this day, blesses all of us this day, and invites us to reflect the presence of our Creator to everyone we meet. Jesus, who has redeemed us, blesses us and invites us to bring healing to this broken world. The Holy Spirit, who calls us to be God's people, blesses us and invites us to tear down the walls that divide us and to build lives of hope for all God's children. Friends, may the peace of the rolling river be with you. May the peace of the silent mountains be with you. May the peace of the singing stars go with you and the deep, deep peace of the Prince of Peace be with you now and forevermore. Amen.